Good morning, Morgan Baptist Church family and others tuning in this Lord's Day. I want to welcome you all here to Morgan Baptist Church as we sing songs to our King, as we study scripture, and as we pray with one another as well. Thank you for worshiping with us this Lord's Day. I want to start us off with just a couple quick announcements and prayer concerns. Again, um, as you see, you're at home. Uh, we're not gathering with one another physically speaking, but we are gathering spiritually speaking. We are worshiping in our homes with our families, and we're going to continue to do this this Sunday, March the 29th, as well as next Sunday, April the 5th. And after April 5th, we are going to gather as a deacon body, and we're going to um, discuss how we should proceed moving forward with our coming worship services. And so at least this Sunday and next Sunday, and we will pass on that information to you for our plan after this time. So I, I pray that this is a time where we can worship with one another in spirit and in truth in our living rooms, in your dining rooms, with your immediate family, your spouse, your kids, your grandkids. I just, uh, I'm so excited to see what the Lord is going to do today with everyone tuning in this morning. A couple other uh, prayer concerns, announcements include, we received a letter from the Pregnancy Care Center in Lebanon, uh, just a thank you letter. Thank you for helping them out uh, financially with some resources and things like that. And so I wanted to pass that along to each and every one of you all who helped participate in that ministry a couple of months ago. We received a thank you note, and so thank you guys for that. Continue to pray for our leadership. Continue to pray for individuals who are making key decisions during these uncertain days that we are living in. Continue to pray for uh, our Southern Baptist missionaries all around the world, many of whom have had to uh, change their plans a little bit because of this outbreak, this virus. And so continue to lift them up, ask for safety for them and their families, as well as their mission context as well. We also want to say a prayer for our healthcare providers, um, those in our congregation who serve as uh, in the medical field. We want to pray for them, ask a special blessing upon them, as well as the millions of other doctors and nurses who are on the front lines day in and day out. Just ask that God would keep them safe as well as their families as well. We also want to uh, take some time to pray for those in our congregation that have needs. Um, those who are suffering, those who are just going through a rough period of time. Um, there's been a lot of people lose jobs over these last couple of weeks because of the economic impact of this virus. And so if that's you today, um, I'm praying for you. We're all praying for you. Um, let us know if there's any way that we can possibly be of assistance to you and help you out in this time of need. We also want to lift up uh, continue to lift up Bud and Linda Caffey as Bud had his procedure uh, delayed a little bit because all hospitals are suspending non-essential surgeries. And so continue to pray for Bud um, as he's in some discomfort. Pray for Linda as well and pray that this procedure is able to be rescheduled sooner rather than later. That way they can get back to 100%. We also want to lift up our villages in India that we have committed to as a church to pray for. If you want any more information about um, what uh, villages you're supposed to be praying for during this upcoming week, please contact myself or Lori, and we will pass along that information to you. Again, it's an awesome day to be able to gather, to be able to worship the Lord, even though we're not gathered physically, we are gathered spiritually. And so I'm excited again to see what the Lord is going to do during this time. Our songs for today include Crown Him With Many Crowns, Blessed Assurance, My King Is Coming, and Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. And so some of these songs, uh, I guess all of them are going to be familiar in some capacity. Blessed Assurance and Amazing Grace, they have... Um, the, the traditional verses, and then they have a chorus that has been added over the last uh, couple of years. And so you might not recognize the chorus, but you're going to know the verses. And so I invite you during this time to go ahead and look up the lyrics as we prepare to enter into our song service. That way you can worship along and make a joyful noise. 
I love you guys. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to go ahead and start singing. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this time that we have to be able to pause in our busy schedules. Um, God, there's so much going on right now. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of confusion. And so, Father, it's my prayer that during this time that we would pay attention, as Hebrews 2, 1 reminds us to do, that we would pay attention to your word, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth, and that during this time of singing, that we would just lift up our voice, that we would make a joyful noise, and that these songs wouldn't just be words that are said, but that they would be worship from our heart as we give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. Father, during this time, rid us of all distractions, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, and then all things help us to apply um, your truth into our lives. That way we can leave our homes this week and witness for you in the grocery store, at work, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and also in our families. We'll give you the glory along the way. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 23 say, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Please join us in worship as we sing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. just a couple moments ago, this is a very uh, common uh, song that we've heard. This is a well-known song. We know the verses. We know the verses to Blessed Assurance. And what happened a couple of years ago is there was a group of Christian songwriters who were inspired to come up with a chorus to go along with this song. And so the, the reason that we have this Blessed Assurance as Christians is because we have confidence that our king is coming and he is coming soon. And so this is a song that you're going to know the verses. You might not know the chorus, but it's very easy to sing along with and to let this be the cry of your heart. And so sing this out. Blessed assurance, my king is coming. Blessed 
time of studying God's Word. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. We thank you for the truths that we just proclaimed, that you are, you are in control, that you are seated, you are high and lifted up, and that as Christians, we have a blessed assurance because we know that you are in control. We know that you are high and lifted up, that you are also coming again someday soon father we thank you for your grace we thank you for the grace that transforms the grace that sets us free and father as we begin to study your word out of hebrews 2 1 through 4 god i ask that you will speak through me that you will just be with us during this time of study and that you will just speak through your holy spirit that you will convict hearts and open eyes to the truth of your word and that we wouldn't just attain some head knowledge today but that rather we would apply your word into our hearts and that we would leave our homes changed and that we would be the hands and feet of Jesus as we encourage the world around us to not neglect so great a salvation 
Father, be with us, rid us of all distractions, and be with us in this time. It's in your name we pray. Amen. As we continue our study of the book of Hebrews, I want to pause and ask you all to do some investigative thinking today. Think back to the absolute best news that you have ever heard in your entire life. For many of you, you immediately went to a story. You immediately went to a situation that uh, just popped up into your mind. For some of you who uh, discovered that you and your spouse are expecting to become parents in the coming months, maybe that's the best news that you have ever heard. For others of you, maybe the greatest news that you've ever heard heard was that you got accepted into your dream college. For others of you, maybe the best news that you have ever heard is that you got accepted or you have been promoted in your job. You have been given this opportunity to interview for a job. For the husbands who are tuning in and worshiping with us this morning, the greatest single word that you have ever heard in your entire life after you got down on one knee, hopefully, was from your spouse or soon-to-be spouse as your wife said yes whenever you asked her to be your forever bride. We know that there are a lot of good memories that we have as humans. We know that there is good news out there, and Scripture talks about good news as well. In the Old Testament, we know that Scripture tells us about a man named Abraham. And God told Abraham that he would make Abraham into a mighty and powerful nation, as his descendants would be as numerous as the grains of sand on the beach, and that through his offspring, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Now, that's pretty exciting news, regardless of who you are, but it's especially exciting news considering that Abraham was 100 years old and that Abraham only had one son at the time of this promise. The Old Testament also talks about some good news being delivered to prophets, such as Jeremiah and Isaiah. Jeremiah was told that a new covenant would be made in the future in Jeremiah 31, 33, as the Bible says. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's exciting news, because no longer is the law written on tablets of stone, but instead the law is literally inside of us as Christians, because we know that the Holy Spirit resides inside of us. That's incredible news. The prophet Isaiah was also given exciting news whenever he was told that there would be a Messiah, a Savior, who would come to redeem and reconcile Israel. And Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government, or of peace, on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it, and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. This is exciting news, that there is coming a Savior who would sit upon the throne and rule with justice forevermore. The New Testament also talks about some exciting news as well, as we see right from the get-go in the New Testament gospel accounts, Mary and Joseph are told that they are going to be parents of Jesus Christ. Now, for those of you, um, like Lindsay and I, we found out about three months ago that, that we are going to be parents. And if you've ever been in that situation, either with adoption or with pregnancy, you know that whenever you find that out, there are a flood of emotions that come upon you. There's a whole lot of emotions. Initially, you feel really excited, like, oh, wow, well, like, we're going to be parents. Wasn't expecting that, but awesome, that's exciting. And then there's also, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be totally transparent and admit this, there, there's also the, the, the anxiousness, the worriness that comes in, like, 
we weren't expecting this. This was not a part of our plan, but this is happening. And so there's a lot of emotions that come upon us, and you know what that is like in that situation if you've been there. But I cannot imagine being in Mary and Joseph's shoes as they were given this news from an angel, not from a pregnancy test or not from an adoption uh, social worker. They were given this news from an angel. That would have been life altering good news. We know that there's good news, but we also know in our world today, there's a lot of bad news out there. There are messages, some true, some false, but in general, the messages we hear are bad. There's messages of destruction, of devastation and death left and right. Families are anxious. Leaders are uncertain about the future. People are just wondering when things will get back to normal. And even though that's the case right now, even though there's a lot of bad news that is flooding our media day in and day out, we know that there is hope in Jesus Christ. The greatest news of all is not that one day in the future, hopefully soon, that things will return back to normal. The greatest news of all is not the Bruno Mars song that says you are perfect just the way you are. The greatest news of all is that Jesus came to live, to die, to raise from the dead, and better, to reconcile sinners like you and I to a holy, pure, just God. That's the greatest news of all. And as the preacher of Hebrews notes, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? If we neglect what Jesus has done, how will we escape? The answer is you can't because Jesus saves, friends. Jesus saves. As the hymn puts it, Jesus can help me. Jesus alone. And so in a, in a world that is full of despair, in a world that is giving a lot of bad news, we look to Jesus today and we are filled with hope as we do so. So please turn in your copy of God's word to Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders, and by various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to His will. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you're zoning in and out. Maybe that's you this morning. I pray not, but maybe that's you right now. You're zoning in, you're zoning out because we are in our homes. Maybe you have uh, the sermon being streamed on your computer, your tablet, you have your phone out following along in scripture, and then you have the TV on, and maybe you're just zoning in and out back and forth. Students tuning in. Maybe this is true of you just a couple of weeks ago. Whenever you were in school, you were drifting in and out. You were zoning in and out from whenever your teacher was teaching you. And being a, a para at Lebanon High School, I can attest to the fact that this happens on a daily basis in almost every class. And whenever a student is drifting in and out of paying attention and not paying attention, I love what teachers do. Because newsflash, teachers always know who is zoning out and who is actually paying attention. And so I love what teachers do because whenever you're zoning out, they love to call on those kids, right? They love to call on the kids who had their head on the table. They love to call on the kids who are turned around talking to their neighbor. And whenever they call on you and ask you a question, you're left with two options. On the one hand, you can own up and say, my bad, I shouldn't have been doing that. I'll pay attention. And most of the time, the teacher's like, thank you and moves right along. But on the other hand, some students try to just wing it. They, they, they wing their way. They, they say whatever comes to their mind, and oftentimes that leads them to much greater trouble. Friends, we are a people who simply do not pay attention very well, regardless of age. If you are a teenager, if you are 
a, a senior adult, we simply do not pay attention very well in our world today. And again, maybe that's you right now. Nikki Graves, a professor, a university professor, said this, We currently live in a culture that fosters attention deficit disorder because of our hyper-connectivity. This is certainly true of our younger crowd today. I'll, I'll be honest, myself included, because we seem to always have a device in our hand. We always seem to be watching something or playing a game or communicating or something along those lines, and we never, ever stop. In fact, many of us, maybe you again this morning, you're doing multiple things at once. We multitask because we don't have the attention span to just do one thing or we tell ourselves, I can worship and I can do my work at the same time. We try to do multiple things at once. I love technology. I am the biggest advocate of technology because guess what? Without technology, we would not be able to be having our worship services together during these last couple of weeks. I love technology during this time of social distancing, but there is a but here. Technology also plays a direct role in our shorter attention spans. And so as a people group right now, we are suffering because we do not pay attention very well. And so what we see as we read Hebrews 2, we see right from the very get-go, and maybe your Bible has a heading above Hebrews 2, and it says, this is a warning to pay attention. And that's exactly what Hebrews 2.1 is, because in Hebrews 2.1, we see, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention. What is the reason? What is being talked about? What must we pay attention to? In the Greek text, in Hebrews 2.1, the word that we see in for this reason is the term dia. And dia can also mean therefore. Dia has like a dozen different meanings out there. It's kind of like our word like. We use like all the time. Dia is kind of similar. There's a million different meanings for this term, but it can also mean therefore. And it does mean that oftentimes. And we know that whenever we see a therefore in scripture, what do we have to do? We have to see what it is there for. And so the preacher starts Hebrews 2.1 off with therefore, or for this reason. And so we can't just start our study today by going through verses 1 through 4 of Hebrews 2, because we have no idea what the reason is. We have to go back to Hebrews chapter 1. In Hebrews 1, we have to understand what the theme of these 14 verses were in the theme, everything that has been building up into this point in Hebrews leads us to Hebrews 2, 1. The, the, the build up to this point is that because Jesus is better, because he is greater, we must pay much close attention to what he says. The angels have a message to share. The angels, as we discussed last week, are God's messengers. They have authority. But how much closer should we pay attention to what Jesus says? Because Jesus is not just a messenger of God. Jesus is God's only begotten Son. He is the eternal Son of God. Therefore, we must listen to what He says. We must obey His teachings, and we must not drift away from His message. You have two options as an individual. We love to live in a world of color. Where, where you can do this and you can do that and I can do this and I can do that. But friends, there's two options today. You can either accept Jesus as Lord and Savior or you can reject it. There is no gray area. It is black. It is white. And so further, if you are a Christian, if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if he is Lord of all, then now you are facing another choice. And you have to ask yourself this question right now. Am I progressing in my faith? Am I becoming more like Jesus or am I drifting away from him? Because this was spring break and because golf falls under the umbrella of an essential activity and social distancing, uh, my wife and I, we had the opportunity this week to go and play a couple of rounds of golf. I also was able to play with a couple friends of mine and I'm an avid golfer. I'm a passionate golfer. But I would never say that I'm a good golfer. I would never uh, confuse anyone and lie. But I love playing golf. And one of the most uh, awesome things about 
golf is that whenever you hit just one good shot, that's all it takes. It, it's, it, it, it just gets inside of you. It gets inside your bloodstream. I've never done drugs or anything like that, but I can only imagine that that is how drugs act as well. Because if you hit a good golf shot, it's like you're addicted. You've got to keep on coming back. And if you've ever played golf, just as there's an occasional good shot, there's an awful lot of bad shots out there. And what happens a lot of times, or at least sometimes, is you'll have a plan set up. You'll have a target in mind. You see the green. You know where you want the ball to go. And then you swing. You hit the ball. And maybe the ball starts right on line. But you know what happens a lot of times in golf? The ball never goes straight. The ball always moves to the right or to the left. It always slices or it hooks. And there are few things that are more frustrating than starting a golf shot right on line and having it hook and keep on hooking and keep on hooking until it goes into a pond. It's one of the most frustrating things. And you're wondering, why did it drift away? It looked so good. And in golf, what can be really aggravating is that you can do the same thing every single time. You can have the same mindset, you can have the same grip, you can have the same plan, but what happens is the ball doesn't get the plan. The ball doesn't go along with how it's supposed to go. The ball has a mind of its own and no two shots end up the same, it seems like. You can be focused in golf and still end up in trouble, and just as that is the case, in golf. It is also the case in our life right now. You can do everything right. You can have a good preparation. You can have a good setup, but unless you pay attention, unless you obey the living active word of God, you will drift away from your intended destination. Our world is so confused when it comes to drifting away because a lot of people say, oh, just be yourself. Follow your heart. Go wherever you feel like going. And those messages make us feel really good, don't they? They make us feel good about ourselves because we are in control. I'm going to follow my heart. But the problem is that that's not scripture. Because scripture reminds us in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Why would you trust a sick, deceitful Heart, instead, trust Scripture. As Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 reminds us, trust not in your heart, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. And all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Friends, we have to reorient our desires instead of pleasing ourselves and doing what we want to do. We have to trust and seek and lean upon the Lord. And in doing this, what happens? Well, we get conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Either we trust in ourselves and we go with the flow of our world, or we trust in the word of God. And as we trust in the word, we stand firm against our world, which tells us to do other things. And so I ask you right now, everyone tuning in, friends, church family, are you paying attention? Not just literally, are you paying attention right now, but are you paying attention to the word of God? Are you paying attention to Jesus Christ? Because there's so many things vying for our attention right now. You might be thinking, well, we're stuck in our homes. How on earth are there so many things vying for our attention? That There are so many things out there that there are, uh, there are streaming services like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, and now there's Disney Plus. And all of these streaming services are now suddenly offering all sorts of movies that you can watch early now because we're all under a, a, a social distancing order. We're all in our homes. And so many of us are tempted to just uh, go with the flow and binge watch some really good TV shows or binge watch some movies. Maybe you're a little different. Maybe technology is not up your alley. Maybe instead, there's a lot of home improvement projects that you need to catch up on. Maybe there's some chores that you need to go ahead and get caught up with, and maybe that is what is causing you to stay busy during this time. Maybe for others of you, it's playing games, either video games or 
board games if any of you kids actually play board games. Maybe for others it's reading. It's reading, it's discussing uh, and having conversation with your family members. And these things aren't bad. It's not bad to watch movies. It's not bad to get caught up on uh, improvement projects. It's not bad to play games. It's not bad to read books. But we have to ask ourselves, even during this time, am I paying attention to God's word first and foremost? Am I becoming more like Jesus today than I was yesterday? Or am I drifting further away from him? Am I stagnant? Friends, don't drift. Don't be stagnant because just as Jesus told the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3, be either hot or lukewarm for be either hot or cold because if you are lukewarm, I will spit, I will vomit you out of my mouth. So friends, don't be lukewarm. Be hot, be on fire for scripture. And if you're drifting, if you're stagnant, if you're lukewarm right now, look to the cross, fall on your knees in prayer and understand the message of Jesus. For many of us, if we saw an angel standing before us right now, and that angel said, hey, wake up, straighten your life out, what would we do? Well, first, we'd have a heart attack, because we just saw an angel. But then after we have the heart attack, we wake back up, and then what do we do? We're going to straighten our life out, because an angel told us to. That is a huge wake-up call. Church. Jesus' message is superior to any message from the angels. And what does Jesus call us to do? He calls us to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross and follow him. So are you following Jesus today or are you drifting further away from him? I pray that that's true of you. I pray that you are being conformed into the image of Jesus, that you love spending time with Jesus, that you are paying attention to his word, and that that matters infinitely more than anything else right now. Verses 2 through 3 illustrate the fact that we should not neglect the message of Jesus's salvation. In verses 2 through 3, we see that there was a message spoken about by the angels. As we covered last week, angels were messengers of God. They are ministering spirits. They bring about messages from God, And one of the most well-known messages they bring is found in Galatians 3.19, where Paul says, Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator, until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Acts 7.53, in Stephen's sermon, he said this, You who received the law as ordained by angels, and yet did not keep it. The people of Israel received the law from an angelic messenger. We see this fact in, in uh, the Old Testament in Deuteronomy um, and Exodus as well. And in Deuteronomy, what we see that's really cool is that there is a choice that is made because of the law. Deuteronomy 30 says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. The law, the old covenant law was very simple. If you obey it, you live. If you disobey it, you die. The word that was spoken about from the angels stated that every sin, every transgression, every disobedient act led to a just penalty as a result of this. We're familiar with what Paul says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 reminds us of this devastating fact as well. Because we are sinners, because of our sin, the wages of our sin is death. And friends, we love to fight that, don't we? We love to say, oh, I'm not really that bad. I know some bad people. I know some people who are murderers. I know people who have stolen a lot of money. I know people out there who have done and said terrible, terrible things. My sin is not as bad as their sin. Therefore, I am not a bad sinner like Paul talks about in Romans 3, Romans 5, and Romans 6. That's the mentality of many people in our world 
today, many people compare themselves with others rather than comparing themselves with Jesus Christ because the bar that God sets is sinless perfection. The bar set by God is not get an A on this test. The bar set by God is you can never, ever mess up. We all mess up. We all fall short. And so uh, in, in that sense, where's the hope? Well, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament law, where's the hope there? Because we all fall short. Well, in the Old Testament, what they had to do is they had to bring a blood sacrifice once a year. The Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, they would bring a blood sacrifice and the blood of that animal would cover their sins for one year. It would postpone the wrath, the judgment of God upon them. And in doing so, the next year they would have to do the same thing and again and again. But now that's no longer the case because of what Jesus did for us. Because Jesus died on the cross and because he died, all of our disobedience, all of our transgression, all of our sin was placed upon him. If you are in Christ, because Paul says there is therefore now no condemnation because Jesus bore the punishment. Jesus paid it all. Verse 3 summarizes this well when it says, How then will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? If you neglect the message, the, the gospel salvation found in Jesus Christ, how will you escape the coming judgment? To put it blunt, you can't. You can't escape because it is only through Jesus Christ. The argument employed here is what is called call Homer. It is light and heavy. If the old covenant that was given by God's angels said that the punishment of sin is a deserved punishment now how much greater is the punishment of sin going to be if you reject not only an angel of god but the eternal son of god turn to revelation 19 15 and you see how that judgment works out it's not good i love what martin lloyd jones says about this great salvation as he reminds us of this the message of the christian church is not merely exhortation to men and women to live a better life. I want to pause there because I love what he says next. That's not Christianity. Christianity is not here's five steps to be a better person. He continues to say this. Many agencies can do that and are doing that. The essential thing about the Christian message is that it is a message of good news of salvation. We have to emphasize that this is the greatest and most wonderful news that has ever come into the world. This is the greatest news in the whole wide world, friends. The great news that Jesus paid it all. That if you are in Christ, that, that it's paid in full. That you don't have to do anything else. Jesus paid that punishment in full. And so, friends, we must not neglect that message. To neglect something is to fail to take care of it. If any of you are parents or grandparents or know teenage boys, or if you are a teenage boy, you know that teenage boys, I'm speaking out of experience, sometimes neglect to take care of their personal hygiene. Sometimes a teenage boy goes throughout their day, they go to gym class at school, they go on a run, they play outside, and then they get sweaty, they get muddy, and what do they do whenever they come back in the house or in the locker room? They get Axe body spray and they spray it on themselves. And friends, I'm just going to put this very clear teenage boys tuning in. Axe doesn't work. You still stink. Even if you're oblivious to it, don't use Axe. Go take a shower. It's going to take five minutes. It's going to make you smell much better. We cannot neglect our personal hygiene. We certainly cannot neglect so great a salvation as we have through Jesus Christ. We need to remind ourselves of the good news of Jesus Christ every day. We need to remind us of what Jesus has done for us on the cross because it's not because I was a good person. It's not because I deserve this. I'm a sinner. I fall short every day, but Jesus paid it all. 
And friends, my hope is in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It's not in my works. It's in what Jesus and Jesus alone did. Sometimes we get busy in life and we forget the gospel. Sometimes we read scripture and we're reading a devotion maybe. And the devotion says, here's five ways to be more merciful, to be a better person, to do this thing a little bit better in life. Here's some tips to be a better human. But that's not the story of Scripture, is it? The story of Scripture isn't, here's 10 ways to be a better human being. Here's 10 ways to be a better sinner. That's not the gospel. The gospel message is that it starts out with bad news. It says you're dead. Not you're lost. Not you're bad. The gospel says you are dead. You are without hope. But God made you alive with Jesus Christ, we were all dead, but praise God for salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. As Peter says in Acts 4, 12, there is salvation in no one else. No one else. It is through Jesus and Jesus alone. And so that brings us to verse 4, to this final point that you must respond to Jesus's message of salvation. We have a responsibility right now, you and I, we have to ask ourselves, have we responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ? I ask you, have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ today? Do you have the confidence that Paul talks about in Galatians 2.20, where he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Is that your testimony this morning? Do you believe in Jesus? Have you been crucified with him? Because whenever you become a Christian, this is a huge misconception in the church. Sometimes we think, oh, I prayed the prayer. Oh, I've been baptized. I'm good. I don't have to do anything else. I've got my get out of hell free card, like from Monopoly. That's not Christianity. That's the biggest lie that Satan tries to sell people from the pits of hell. That's not Christianity. Real Christianity is you are crucified with Christ. Your old self is put to death. As Paul says, the old has gone. Behold, the new has come. And so is that true of you this morning? Because the greatest decision that you can ever make in your entire life is to follow Jesus Christ to respond to this message positively. And that's my prayer for everyone tuning in this morning, that, that we would respond positively to what Jesus Christ has done for sinners on the cross of Calvary, that our eyes might be open, that our hearts might be softened, and that this message would turn on a light bulb and that we would respond positively to this message of salvation. This message was brought about First, according to verse 3 of Hebrews 2, first, through Jesus Christ, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Some people say that Jesus never claimed to be God. Jesus was just a good teacher. He was a good guy. But this argument falls flat on its face. Jesus knew, Jesus declared that this was an exclusive road. It's through him and him alone. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 remind us, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many that enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few that find it. And so I ask you today, have you crowned Jesus? Is he the Lord of your life? Do you follow him? Do you obey him? And finally, are you on the narrow path or are you traveling down the wide road? Because the wide road promises awesome things. It's really comfortable. It's very traditional in our setting, but it leads to eternal destruction. The message, according to the preacher of Hebrews, was first preached by Christ and then according to verse 3 of Hebrews 2, this message was confirmed to us by those who heard. This is a little tricky for us to understand, but 
I, I want to sit here a little bit and do some digging through this text because Hebrews 2, 3 tells us that first Jesus preached the good news. And then there were those who heard the good news who told it to others who did not hear Jesus. And then the preacher of Hebrews says there is us, Jesus, those who heard Jesus, and then us, meaning down here, the preacher of Hebrews on the third platform. And so think for a moment, whenever we talked about the authorship of Hebrews, we talked about how a lot of people think that Paul wrote Hebrews. Think for a moment about the apostle Paul. Did Paul ever hear from the resurrected Jesus Christ? Yes, he did on the Damascus road. In fact, Paul said, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so Paul literally heard from Jesus, Jesus, those who heard Jesus, which would have been Paul. And then down here, the preacher of Hebrews says, then there's us. So did Paul write Hebrews? We don't know for certain, but based on Hebrews 2, 3, it appears as though he did not. Again, this doesn't particularly pertain to our overall message on Jesus saving, but again, context matters. It matters. It's important for us to do good exegetical study nonetheless. Again, the message was preached by Jesus. It was taught to others. And what did those people who heard Jesus do? What did they do with that message? They went out and preached that message as well. Even though the preacher of Hebrews himself had not heard from Jesus, he heard about Jesus's message of salvation through those who had heard. And so church, friends tuning in, listen, ask yourself this question right now. If I am a Christian, if you are a Christian, what am I doing to share the good news of Jesus with those around me? Or am I doing anything to share the good news of Jesus with others? Look at the early church. Christianity was outlawed. It was illegal. Christians were persecuted. They were crucified upside down. They were beheaded. They were thrown into the gladiator pits and arenas, and they were slaughtered. Yet, Christianity exploded under persecution. In our Western culture today in America, we know that Christianity is not persecuted at all. Maybe you get made fun of, uh, fun of a little bit for not believing in science. Maybe that's what we consider persecution, but we're not persecuted at all. And what's happened with Christianity in the West over the last couple of decades? It's declined every single decade. And so what's the correlation here? Why does Christianity explode whenever there's persecution? There's one component. Whenever you are being persecuted for your faith, you own it for yourself rather than simply believing something because mom and dad do. So kids listening today, why are you listening? Why do you come to church? Why are you worshiping today? Is it just because mom and dad have it turned on? Is it just because mom and dad tell you to get up at 10 o'clock and come to church? I pray not. I pray that it's something much deeper, more intimate than that. I pray that you own your own faith. Who's going to give their life up for something they don't believe in? No one. You'd be a fool to do so. I pray that we would be bold. I pray that we would have a passion to share this good news, to own our faith for ourselves, just as Christians have done for 2,000 years. Verse 4 wraps this up by showing that God testified the truthfulness of the gospel by displaying signs and wonders as well. The early church in Acts, we know, also performed some signs and wonders that are miraculous as well. Jesus did all sorts of things during his earthly ministry to prove to those around him that he is who he said he was, that he is the Messiah and that the kingdom of God is now at hand. And we know that things work a little bit differently for us today. There are some people out there that say, I can do the same miracles that Jesus did. I have this heavenly anointing that I can touch you and you will be cured of this illness if you just give me enough money. Oh, you won't get coronavirus. Just send me a thousand bucks in the mail and I'll pray for you. Charlatans, wolves disguised in sheep's 
clothing. There's nothing new under the sun. Stuff like this has been going on for a very long time. Friends, don't fall victim to stuff like that because that's not the gift. That's not the miraculous stuff that's being talked about here because it's all through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not our own power. We are not able to do these things. It's the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us that convicts us, that brings about that all wonderful power, that resurrection power. We do know this though. Hebrews 2, 4 tells us that there are gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. If you are a Christian today, you have a spiritual gift. We've talked about spiritual gifts a lot at Morgan Baptist Church. They are wonderful things. They are gifts from above that we are called to use, to use in our local church, in our daily lives, and to share the name of Jesus as we use our spiritual gift. I've seen examples of friends who were so shy that they could not stand in front of a large group at school or even at our home church, that they were terrified of talking about a project, of giving a report in front of others. But these same shy kids, if they're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter if there's 10,000 people in the room, they have this incredible gift to share that good news with the lost. That's a spiritual gift. I've seen examples of other friends who weren't exactly the nicest of people out there. But praise God, as soon as they became a Christian, they had the gift of mercy. They had the gift of service. And suddenly, they were really nice to other people. As Christians, we're all given at least one gift. And we are commanded to use that gift to share the name of Jesus, to edify the church, to build one another up. And what better time to use our gifts to be the hands and feet of Jesus than right now, when we cannot physically meet. Use your gift if you are a child of God today. So what was Jesus' message? It was really simple. There is salvation in one name alone, the name of Jesus Christ. Other people might make some bold claims. They might promise a whole lot that at the end of the day, only Jesus can save you of your sin before a holy God. And so I ask you, have you repented of your sins? Have you placed your trust in Jesus today? I pray that you have. I pray that you have done that because that is the most important, the most crucial decision that you can ever make. If you have not done that yet, why not? Why not? Today can be your day of salvation. As Hebrews 2, 3 reminds us, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? Don't ignore it. Accept it. Believe it. Repent of your wrongdoings and trust in Jesus today. There are five warning passages in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4 is the first one. This shows us that on the one hand, there is hope. There is salvation through Jesus Christ but there's also a warning. And friends, we cannot miss the warning of verse 3. If you reject Jesus, if you do not believe in him today, there is a consequence. And so I pray that you trust in the Lord today. If you have trusted in the Lord, if you do believe in him, if he is the Lord of your life, and I ask you, are you obeying his word today? Are you drifting further away from him or are you becoming closer to him today? Are you sharing this good news with others. We're not simply saved one moment. We're not simply saved to sit on our blessed assurance and wait until kingdom come. Rather, we know that Jesus saves us eternally, but we're justified immediately, and we are called to live a different life, sanctification. We progressively grow to be more like Christ. And so I ask you, do you look more like Jesus today than you did yesterday? Do you look more like him today than you did a year ago. This is a daily choice that we all have to make. And so are you making the choice to die to self, to pick up your cross and follow Christ? Salvation is the greatest news we can ever hear. Therefore, we must share this incredible news with a lost and dying world and tell them what Jesus has done for us. What has Jesus done? He's purified us according to Hebrews 1. 
He's sanctifying us with his word according to John 17, 17. He's interceding on our behalf at the right hand of the Father according to Hebrews 10. His work of atonement is completed. He paid the price in full. And friends, if you are in Christ, there is a blessed assurance, a confidence, a boldness that you have today that the rest of the world does not have. Because your salvation, your hope, your joy is not predicated on the stock market. It's not predicated upon what the experts say. It's not based upon anything this world can do. It's based upon what the eternal Son of God did for you, did for me, and did for all who are in Christ Jesus. As he said, it is finished. I paid it all. And so I ask you, are you in Jesus Christ today? Remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. Remember the message of hope that we have that separates us from a lost and dying world and share that good news with others this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. We thank you so much for what you did for sinners like myself. You sent your son to die on the cross, to die the death that I deserved. But Father, thank you that Jesus didn't stay dead as we're going to celebrate in a couple weeks at Easter. Thank you that three days later, he rose, he conquered sin and death. And 40 days after that, he ascended back on high where he is seated at your right hand, interceding on our behalf right now. Father, thank you for salvation through Jesus Christ. Thank you for the hope that we have through Jesus Father, I just ask a special blessing on every individual who tuned in during this worship time. Father, just continue to guide and direct us during these uncertain waters. Keep us safe. But Father, most importantly, help us to remember the cross. Help us to share the good news of Jesus with a world that needs to hear about the good news of Jesus. Because our world is hopeless right now. And we have hope in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I just ask that you will give us confidence to be able to share this message without fear this week. Help us to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ this week. Give us the words to say, and we'll give you all the glory along the way. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I pray that this has been a good time of worship for each and every one of you tuning in, that during our uh, song service that that was just a sweet time where you could uh, just give praise to the Lord of Lords and King of Kings as we take our eyes off of our world. We take our eyes off of the distractions, off of the news, off of all of the different things going on right now. And instead we look to heaven and we look to Jesus who paid it all. And we know that Jesus is coming back Again, and we know that we have this amazing grace inside of us because we have been set free. And friends, we have to share that message with others. And so, again, I ask of you, have you accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior? If so, share that message with others this week. Share with them what Jesus has done for sinners like yourself and myself. He died on the cross for our sins. That's the greatest message that can ever be shared. Share that message this week. If you guys have any questions, any comments, any prayer requests, any announcements, please give me a call. Shoot me a text. I love you guys. I'm praying for you guys during this season of life. God keep you. God bless you. We'll catch you guys later.